Hi, good morning. Welcome to Bayside Church. My name is Stephanie. I'm one of the pastors here at Bayside, and we're so glad that you're here to worship with us today. And we would love the opportunity to be able to connect with you, whether you're here in person or you're watching online. I want to invite you, if you're here in person, to grab one of the connect cards in the pew right in front of you and take just a minute to fill that out. Be sure to include your email address. We'd love to send you some information about the church. And you can also submit your prayer requests right on that Connect card as well. If you're watching online, let us know. Give us a little hand raise. Um, you could submit your prayer requests right there in the comment section. And then lastly, if you would like to give this morning, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. You can go directly to our website at BaysideChurch.net under that Give tab. Or you can also go to our church app, Bayside Church SH. And then if you're here in person, feel free to drop your offering along with your Connect card in one of the black boxes when you exit the sanctuary today. Well, we're kicking off the new year in this sermon series and Revelation. Uh, we're off to a great start. And I want to invite you to get connected in one of our small groups, our classes. Um, this is a great opportunity right now to get together and to get into God's word. And so there's different opportunities from our small groups to some of the classes that we're offering, Alpha and Financial Peace University as well. Um, Financial Peace is a class that helps people to overcome debt, to plan for the future, and really learn a godly way of managing your money and your resources. And so Financial Peace starts on January 30th. Um, our other classes are starting this Wednesday. So I want to invite you to go to our website at BaysideChurch.net under that Get Connected tab and sign up for one of those classes today. For more information, I want to invite you to visit our website at BaysideChurch.net, as well as our social media at BaysideChurchSH. Well, good morning, guys. She did a good job on the announcement, right? <laughs> like, I think it's so funny. Well, good morning. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us. And I just wanted to take a minute to thank those of you that call Bayside Church home for your faithful giving um, to Bayside and for giving to the mission here to see more people become more like Jesus. Um, and thank you for participating in the dollar offering during the Christmas season. Um, so for those of you that were able to join us in that dollar offering, we invited you each time you came to Bayside to just bring an extra dollar with you or your extra change. And we were gonna donate it to our mission partner, Harbor Dish. And Harbor Dish is one of our local mission partners right here in Safety Harbor, um, doing an amazing job to feed countless people in our community, uh, several different nonprofits. And I don't know if you guys know this, but they're working um, right out of our kitchen here at Bayside. So this is their site where they cook and prepare their meals out of. Um, but today, we want to give you guys the grand total of the offering that was collected for that dollar offering. So I'm going to invite Harbor Dish up um, so that we can gift them with the offering today. You guys want to help me welcome them? And so this is Chris and Marsha, and they do a phenomenal job if... You guys want to volunteer with Harbor Dish? I know they would love that too. So are you guys ready to see how much was collected? You guys did an amazing job. Seriously, this like over blew our expectations in such a huge way. So the total amount that we collected for the offering was $6,006.09. Incredible. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for your generosity and for making this possible. Um, I just want to pray for them, and then we'll continue in worship today. Father, thank you so much for an opportunity to partner with Harbor Dish, to partner with Chris and Marsha, Lord, and just the amazing work that they're doing in the community. Father, I'm so grateful for their willingness to just give of themselves, of their time, of their talent, Lord. And they do it because they love you and they love your people. And so, Father, I just pray a blessing on this ministry, Lord, on the resources that were gifted, Father, that you would just use it in an incredible way, Father, um, to help people, to bring glory to your kingdom, Lord. 
And uh, we thank you for each person that donated, Lord. And again, just for this partnership, Lord, that we're just honored to have. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Welcome to worship today. So glad to have you guys here. Those of you online, welcome to the service, this second part of the Book of Revelation uh, series. So w- glad to have you, and uh, it's, gonna, it's an exciting series. Um, so some of you may have, like me, kind of woke up a little startled this morning. Um, now, see, now, what I, I want to put this in context, though. Like, I don't know if you realize how terrifying it is to go to sleep with the thoughts of revelation in your mind, <laughs> only to be awakened by every device in your house yelling this ominous alert. You know, I'm like, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Those of you online, maybe you're somewhere else, you don't know what we're talking about, but about six o'clock, we had some storms roll through, and there was a sort of an amber alert type alert that hit everybody's phones. Uh, with this, you know, a warning, tornado warning. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was, so I, I, the storms, as far as I know, I know I, we did well, hope you did well. Uh, my cardiac issues, I don't know if I <laughs> fared so well, but the, the storm was not so bad. But we are in this uh, second week of the book of Revelation, and uh, I, I just want to say that, you know, last week was a lot of overview and a lot of sort of overarching things that have to do with the entire book. And so we won't rehearse those every time because there'll be enough to discuss each week. But it is important to kind of keep that in your mind, just to, for example, the four different ways of approaching the book of Revelation. All that stuff is really, really helpful. And we may touch on it from time to time again, but we're not going to spend the kind of time we did last week. So I say all that to, to say, if you, ever, if you just need to recap or review some of that, you can always go back online and check out that first week series. We may even put something uh, online uh, that you can just kind of read up, a PDF or something, just um, if you're interested in that stuff and maybe want to look at it again, uh, those different uh, ways of interpreting the book of Revelation. So uh, just, just offer that as, as a reference to you. So today we are going to wrap up a little bit of chapter one and then go through chapter two and three really quick, <laughs> that, which really means nothing. Have you noticed that when a pastor says that, it really doesn't mean anything. But so I, so I do have my work cut out for me to, co- to cover this much, but I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter one, verse one, that says, long ago, God spoke to us through his prophets, but in these last days, he speaks to us by his son, whom he appointed over all things and through whom he created the entire universe. The reason that's on my mind is because what we're going to look at this morning or today is these words from the exalted Jesus to the church. And I don't know of another place in scripture. Now, of course, Jesus, when he walked the earth, taught and spoke 
and we have that recorded in the Gospels. But we don't, outside of the book of Revelation, we don't have anywhere else where Jesus is speaking to the church after the resurrection. It's only in the book of Revelation that we have this first-person content of Jesus speaking to the church. And it, of course, is relevant and specific to that first century church in Asia. But I think as we look through these words to the church, these seven churches in Asia in A.D. about 90, it's going to feel at points like we're looking in the mirror. It's going to be very familiar to you because these same issues, these same concerns resurface throughout history. And so I, I want to do two things today. Two things will take some time to do, but two things. One is I, the, the message today is about Christ and his lampstands. Christ and his lampstands. Christ and the church. So I want to spend a little bit of time at the beginning talking about Christ. Because the Christ that is going to speak to the church is not the Christ in human form that walked in Palestine. The vision of Christ that John sees is significant. And it's a significant change from the last time they saw him. So we'll talk about that Christ and then what he says to the churches. So... When John sees this vision of Jesus in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, in verse 17, we're told that he fell on the ground. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, fear not, I am the first and the last. Many of us want to hear the tender voice of Jesus saying, do not be afraid. But I think what we also need as much as what we want in the fear not, what we need is a vision like John had. The vision of Jesus who can say to you and can deliver to you what he promises. Because it is the vision and the awareness of who Jesus actually is that causes his words to mean something. And so John sees this vision of Jesus and the vision itself causes him to fall on the ground. So what what did he see? We're told that when he saw Jesus, I'm going to get to the, so if you're following along on the outline, that's going to be at the end. It'll be like as a summary. So don't try to track too close to the outline right now. It'll just be frustrating for you. It's at the end. It's at the end. So when John sees Jesus, the first thing he tells us is that he saw one like the son of man. He saw one like the son of man. Now, whenever you're reading the book of Revelation, it's like reading, and this is, this is a very, it's, probably, it's, it's an appropriate analogy here. <laughs> I guess that's the ones I should be using. But anyway, it's like reading an online article where there are hyperlinks to other things. Like you ever read an article and like certain words will be hyperlinked and you can click on that and it'll take you to another article. And so there's like a phrase or something and you click it. And th- the book of Revelation is like that. John uses these words but they're in phrases, but they're loaded. And they're meant to trigger a whole new, a, an additional backstory that students of the Bible would be familiar with, particularly Jewish students, students of the Bible would be familiar with. And, and the, an example of that is right here, one like the Son of Man. John isn't saying like, I saw something that looked like Maybe like a son of man. No, he's using this phrase that is word for word from the Old Testament. I saw one like the son of man. It's from the book of Daniel. I saw, and those exact words are found in Daniel chapter 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the son of man. 
So John is saying, I saw that one, that one that's like the son of man. I've seen him. The one that the prophets talked about, I've seen him. It's Jesus. The son of man was one of the titles that Jesus most used for himself, right? The son of man came to seek and save the lost. The, came, the son of man came not to serve, but not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The son of man must die and be buried, but on the third day raise the... That's, Jesus would often refer to himself as the son of man. It's this human figure that has been endowed with power from God. And so John says, I saw this one like the son of man, the one that Daniel was talking about. I saw him. And then he says that he is the ancient of days. Verse 14, the hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. Verse 9 in in Daniel says, I looked... Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair and the hair of his head was like pure wool. These phrases are from Daniel, and when they click on them, it brings this whole backstory. So here, the one that John sees is the Son of Man. He's also the Ancient of Days. He's got flowing gray hair. Now, that's what Jesus appeared like. Now we think, man, I I want my Jesus to be buff and young. (laughs) I don't want my Jesus to be old. (laughs) But in antiquity, age was honored. Gray hair was an honor. It, It signified experience, wisdom, understanding, perspective. Isn't it true? The older you get, the more you gain perspective, man. You don't, at least you shouldn't. The more wisdom you get, the longer you live, you're like, look, guys, I'm not going to freak out over this. This thing will be gone by tomorrow. This too shall pass. The older you get, the more you say, this too shall pass. No, it's the end of the world. No, it's not. We'll live. I've seen this before, right? That's what old people say. That's what I'm starting to say more and more. Kids, I've seen this before. But Jesus, and that's significant because Jesus is seen as the son of man. He's also seen as the ancient of days who has, who has, he's seen it all. He's real old. He has been there before everything or anything was created. He's that old. He's the ancient of days. So John blends this human figure, the son of man, with the the divinity of the ancient of days. As Jesus would say of himself before Abraham was, I am. He's the ancient of days. It's a way of reminding anyone who heard these words that Jesus is in charge. I wonder if you've maybe forgotten that today in your life. I wonder if if that's kind of grown cold or, or you've become deaf to that, that God is in charge, that Jesus is in charge. In your life and in the world, as crazy as it may become, as chaotic as it may become, as mundane as it might be, Jesus is in charge. He goes on to tell us that he saw his eyes were like flames of fire. Now, that doesn't take a Bible scholar to figure out the symbolism of that. I mean, the flames of what do flames purify? Flames flames consume. Flames penetrate. So Jesus Christ is this the resurrected Jesus is not only pure and holy, he's also the one that purifies and cleanses. Everything he touches that is not real, that is not of, su- of substance, that is not of godliness, is consumed. And he sees everything. His eyes are like fire. He sees everything. He sees beyond our masks. He sees beyond our veils. He perceives beyond our facades, the things that we put up to impress others, or even the things we do to protect ourselves. He sees beyond it. Now that's scary and liberating. 
that nothing is hidden from his eyes. And because nothing is hidden from his eyes, everything in your life is able to be redeemed, restored through him. We're told that his feet were like glowing bronze, like glowing like in a furnace. And we know from th- that same story, that same book of Daniel, that the kingdoms, that the Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of statues, and one of the statues had iron and clay feet, and that was symbolic of an unstable kingdom, a kingdom that could not withhold the weight of, the, of authority, and it would collapse. But Jesus, his feet, represented his, representing his stability, his kingdom, were like bronze. They will not break. Meaning that Jesus' kingdom will endure. It's unconquerable. It's immovable. He will reign forever. Then we're told his voice was like a waterfall. You've been to waterfalls, large or small, but you can hear the water long before you get to the fall. You can hear it, and as you get closer, it gets louder. And if you're next to a larger fall, when you get right next to it, it's a roar. Like you can be standing by someone and you're like, you can't hear them because it drowns out everything. And so John says his voice, and he gives us two analogies for his voice, first about the sound and then about the substance. The sound is like rushing waters. It's consuming. And the closer it gets, the more overwhelming it is to the point where it's deafening. It's a roar. This isn't the same image of Jesus who was on the Sea of Galilee who had to actually go out into a boat so that he could preach to those on the shore and they could hear him. This is the Jesus that is lifted up and his voice is like a waterfall. And the substance of what he's saying, not the sound, but the substance of what he's saying is like a sword. It's a double-edged sword. It cuts. Now, in the first century, the sword, they, they, this came to mind. This was the Roman sword. This was the instrument of Roman authority. This is what kept the peace in Rome. This is what secured the empire of Rome. The double-edged sword in the, in, the, in the hand of the soldier was the symbol of power and authority of that human institution. But John says, I want you to know what I saw. And what I saw was what was coming out of the mouth of Jesus. The Lord lifted high and lifted up. What was coming out of his mouth What he was saying is the double-edged sword. It cuts, it pierces, it penetrates, it divides between thoughts and intent of the heart, as Hebrews would tell us. His voice is a weapon that pushes back the evil works of darkness and establishes the kingdom of righteousness. Don't doubt it. Jesus' word may appear in the world's eyes as weak, but it is mighty to save. And he will conquer. And then we're told that Jesus, his face, was like looking in the sun at midday. Have you ever tried that for like a second? It hurts. Don't do it. But when the sun's out and you're like, even accidentally, right? Like you can just be, and you, the sun hits you and it like, it, it, it can blind you for a moment. And it takes you a minute for your eyes to adjust because our mortal eyes are not, not capable of taking in that sort of brilliance. And John says, I saw his face. And in the scripture, it's not... It's not just about his face. Like, don't just think about his face. Face in the Bible represents presence. Like when when the Lord may bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. It means may his presence go with you. May May his persona, may his presence, may his grace go with you. And John says his face, his presence was like looking into the sun at noonday. 
In the Old Testament, Moses went into the presence of God to get the Ten Commandments. And when Moses came back down from Mount Sinai, the people said, dude, you look different. There's a, there's, a, there's a radiance about you, a reflective radiance, like Chernobyl. <laughs> you turn the lights on and you're glowing. <laughs> there's, a, there's a radiance. And it was, just a, it was just the absorbed glory of God that was reflecting back through his life. We call it a suntan. <laughs> But you can't look at it. You can't, you can't even behold it. That's why John, when he take all this in, son of man, ancient of days, bronze feet, voice like waters and sharper than two-edged sword, and a, and a persona that's like the sun at noonday, what does he do? He drops on his face. We can understand now, verse 17, I fell at his feet as though dead. And the God-man Jesus took him put his hand on him and picked him up. The all-powerful, conquering God is a God of mercy and grace. But I, wanna, I wanted us to see that because this is the one who's speaking to the church, guys. This isn't one who is opening up a, um, a court for conversation. This isn't one who is like uh, taking votes on what we should do and how it should go from here. This is not one who is uh, open to suggestions. This is not one who isn't sure about what needs to happen. This is not one who is threatened about anything. This is God who is high and lifted up, who sees everything and who is in control of everything, he is the one that is about to speak to the churches. What does he say? Well, he speaks to seven churches in chapters 2 and chapter 3. And these churches, as I said last week, if you follow it geographically, it follows basically a horseshoe. John was on the Isle of Patmos. If you go to the uh, present-day Turkey, around, right off the coast, in a horseshoe shape, you will find these churches or those locations. And the first one he speaks to is Ephesus. And Ephesus was interesting. It, uh, uh, Cody's going to speak more about Ephesus next week. But Ephesus is one of the few churches in the Bible that we, we know a lot about. We know how it started. Uh, we know some of the issues they were facing because First and Second Timothy, Timothy was a pastor in the Ephesus church, and Paul's giving Timothy guidance on solving some of the issues or addressing some of the issues in Ephesus. And here in Revelation, some 20, 30 years after the death of Paul, likely, John gets a revelation of Jesus speaking to that church. Ephesus was this regional center of the cult worship of the emperor. Ephesus was not an easy place to serve Jesus. And so Jesus will say to them, I, I, I have, you have not grown weary. You've been enduring patiently and you've, you've not grown weary. You kept going as some have got, grown weary, but you haven't. It's a commendation. But we see that their zeal has grown cold. Now what the the thing to notice about Ephesus is that they haven't lost their love for one another. They haven't lost their love for the world. They haven't lost their love for Bible study. They haven't lost their love for truth. They haven't lost their love for reading the Bible, studying the Bible, learning the Bible. They love the world. They love each other. They love the Bible. They only have forgotten about Jesus. They've lost their first love. They were evangelizing and teaching and, all, and fighting evil and standing up against this and protesting that. The only problem was they lost their first love. They no longer loved Jesus. Guys, we can't read past that without asking ourselves, what's my first love? 
Am I so busy doing church stuff? Am I so busy trying to stand up for this and against that and trying to keep things holy and right and good, trying to do this, that I've forgotten about my walk with Jesus? John then sees Jesus speak to Smyrna. Smyrna is one of the only, one of two churches that gets no criticism, only commendation. Philadelphia is the other one. Smyrna basically gets a word of comfort and encouragement. Don't be afraid. Continue to be faithful. A crown of life awaits you. I know you feel poor and, and uh, afflicted, but the truth is you're rich. That's what Jesus tells them. You actually are rich. I know what you've been enduring, and you're going to en- endure some more persecution, but there's a crown of life waiting for you. And then he addresses Pergamum. He says, I, I've seen what you've done. I've seen what you've done. You, you didn't, you didn't you, back in the, in the past when Antipas, who was, we don't really know who that is, but presumably a, a, a Christian martyr who was loved by the church. He's, they, so John, or Jesus says, I, I saw that when Antipas was martyred, was killed for his faith, you didn't lose hope. You didn't lose perspective. You kept going. You kept pushing on. And, and I know that you live in a, in a godly, un, ungodly place where Satan has seated. It's a, it's a demonic, evil place. You could think of some places like that in our world. They're just evil. There's so much wickedness. And in Pergamum, there was emperor worship. And it was like the seat of Satan. And, and the, the Lord says, I saw you. I see you. You didn't, in the past, you didn't quit. You kept serving me. But today, you're entertaining leaders who are driving people away from Jesus into lifestyles that are opposed by Christ. Your anything goes spirit is being called out. Then Jesus speaks to Thyatira. They're commended for their faith, service, and perseverance, but he tells them that they've been entertaining, tolerating Jezebel in their midst. Again, this is another click it and find out what the story is. You read the story of Je- Jezebel in the Old Testament, and Jezebel was uh, the, the, the wife of Ahab, and she led people away from God. She encouraged the worship of Baal. She encouraged worship of idols and led people away from the true worship of God. And so, so Jesus says, you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Now, Thyatira, the problem is the exact opposite of Ephesus. Ephesus, their, their, their spirit, is their, their love for Jesus is drying up as they're doing all kind of good things. They're doing a bunch of good things, but their love for Jesus has grown cold. Thyatira is opposite. All under the auspices of love, they're allowing everything and anything. They tolerate sinfulness. Now, here's the thing, guys. There's no perfect church. Amen? There's no perfect church because there's no perfect people. Right. And so, you know, Bayside's not perfect. There's not a church anywhere that's perfect. If you're looking for a perfect church, don't go there. You're going to screw it up. (laughs) You'll ruin it. Don't do it. It doesn't exist. And an indifferent attitude towards sin, however, can ruin a church. If there's an indifference, if it's like, we don't care what you do, we don't care about your life, we don't care about anything, just, just love, 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 love. If that is our spirit, it will ruin a church. It will. I told you, when we read this, it's going to sound like sometimes looking into the mirror of our culture. Because the result of this, the result of not loving Jesus, the result of just tolerating anything is what Jesus will say is, I am going to take away the lampstand. How many of you know you don't have to be a biblical scholar to figure out that ain't good? That's, that's not a positive. Positive. 
Sardis is the fourth church, beginning in chapter 3. And he says, uh, you have a reputation for being alive, for being all that in a box of chocolates. You have a reputation for being in the community and doing this and doing that, and you're growing and you're big and you're awesome and people are impressed. You have a reputation for all these things, but the problem is you're not awake, you're asleep. You've pooped yourself. It's in the Bible. It says you soiled your clothes. You're walking around with crap in your pants. You're welcome. No extra charge. <laughs> Your diaper's full. You think you're all that, but your diaper's full. You've all seen little kids when it's full. That ain't cool. It says, but you're promoting yourself like you're that, you're all that, you're killing it. But the truth is you've soiled your clothes. The only redeeming factor is this. There are a few in your church that actually haven't soiled their clothes. What does that mean? It means there's no true devotion to Jesus. There's no true holiness. There's no true desire for righteousness. You're just busy. You've impressed the world, but Jesus says, I'm not impressed. To me, you're walking around with soil in your diaper. The sixth church, the, some, of y'all just, some of you are like, man, I just want to check Bayside out today. <laughs> you picked a good one. You picked a good one. (laughs) The sixth church is Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? Not the one in the United States, but it means the same thing, city of brotherly love. And this was another church, one of the two, that is given no correction, only commendation. It's clearly a solid church. It's unlike the previous letter. It's uh, commendation and praise. Keep the faith. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. Endure patiently. Jesus has noted their trouble and their desire to continue to serve him and their willingness to do it in the face of persecution. So what Jesus tells the church in Philadelphia is just keep holding on to what you got. Just keep doing it. Keep keep at it. And he reminds them, he gives them the hope, I'm coming soon. I, I will come and redeem you. I will come and get you. I'm coming soon. The seventh church is Laodicea. It's the one church that gets no compliments at all, no praise at all. The letter to Sardis was troubling enough, but at least there were a few in the in the in the church that were hadn't soiled their, their garments. But Laodicea doesn't even have a few people. They have cold hearts. He says, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, but you are lukewarm. And because you are, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. They had a claim that they were rich and powerful and prosperous and full, but the all-seeing, all-knowing eyes of Jesus says, no, you are poor, blind, and naked. I think that says a whole lot about nominal Christianity. You know what nominal Christianity is? It's where I'm a Christian on Sundays. I'm a Christian in name only. But there's no marked difference between my life and anyone else's, even those who don't claim Jesus. That's nominal Christianity. It's There's a better word for it, guys. It's practical atheism. It's practical atheism. Like when it comes to the when it comes to where the rubber hits the road, there's no distinctive 
impact that Jesus makes on my life or my decision making or my lifestyle. There's no significant impact. Yes, I go to church. Yes, I get a goose bump. Yes, I'm a member of such and such church, but Jesus doesn't impact my life. I don't ask him about the things that I do. I have no concern with whether he's a, he approves or disapproves. I don't care. That's practical atheism. And Jesus says that is lukewarm Christianity and there is no way to, to sugarcoat this. He will spit it out of his mouth. You could read that a hundred times and you're not going to make that sound nice. I've tried. Because I like to say nice things. There's no way to interpret spit you out of my mouth to mean he's actually okay with what you're doing. Nor can you interpret it to mean I think they're going to be with Jesus forever in eternity. You don't spit something out of your mouth that you like. Welcome to Bayside. (laughs) So in summary, all of that was just introduction. Now in summary, no, this is quick. This will be quick, I promise. Seven things that we observe from all of this. Chapter one, at the end of chapter one, two, three. We covered three chapters, guys, so you got to give me a break, all right? I know you're going long, Terry. I know I'm going long, but it's three chapters. Help a brother out here, okay? All right, first thing. The God-man, Jesus, walks among the church. This is beautiful. Again, when you click this, it takes you all the way back to the garden where God walked with Adam and Eve. In the cool of the day, he fellowshiped with them. He spoke with them. It was intimate. It was personal. There were no barriers. And here the resurrected Jesus, who is all of the things that we discussed, is now walking among the lampstands. Some people think, well, if you want to know what God's doing, find out what he's doing in the world and join him there. I want to suggest to you, if you want to know what God is doing, if you want to know the intimate presence and heartbeat of God, you don't find it in the world. You find it in the church. You find it where Jesus is. Now, is Jesus at work in the world? Of course. But he's at work in the world through the church, through the people of God. So if you want to know what God's up to, if you want to know his heart, he's walking among the lampstands. Friends, if we could peel back the heavens this morning, if we could peel back the heavenlies, and you could see past carpet and pews and wall paint and the ceiling, if you just peel it back and you could see into the heavenlies, you would see Jesus, the Lord of glory, walking among this lampstand. Yeah. He would be walking among this lampstand and down the road at the church there and everywhere they've gathered lifting up the name of Jesus, he would be walking and talking to the church. Second thing is he knows the church. (laughs) We can't. Church, we can't pull anything over on Jesus. He knows us. He knows the world too. He knows everybody. But he knows the church. He sees us inside and out. He knows us. Over and over, as he, Jesus was addressing the churches, he starts with these words I know your deeds. Now, that right there just caused you to get nervous. <laughs> If Jesus, like, you know, what, if Jesus just came up to any of us and said, I know your deeds, you're like, I'm sorry. Because we know we've fallen short. He knows us. Third, he commends over and over to all these seven churches, of the, uh, seven letters to the church, he commends their endurance of suffering. Every time you've endured suffering, you've endured persecution. Our willingness, guys, our willingness to endure suffering for the gospel is one of the principal ways, A, to to know whether we're saved or not, and B, it's a measure of spiritual faithfulness. Our willingness to endure suffering. If I get left out of things because I'm a Christian, I get overlooked because I'm a Christian. People say things about me because of my faith in Jesus. Um, I'm mocked because of my faith in Jesus. I'm misunderstood because of my faith in Jesus. My ability to endure that is 
indicative of A, I'm truly a child of God, and B, it's a sign of spiritual faithfulness. Number four, over and over to these letters, the, in these letters, he warns against compromise. Many of the churches emerge, many of the seven churches emerge more as those who've compromised rather than those who are committed. Sexual immorality and idolatry are some of the chief problems in the churches of Pergamum, Thyatira, and the United States. In both, in all three, false teaching led to false behavior, as it always does. And he warns against compromise. Now, that doesn't mean being disagreeable about everything. (laughs) It means that we compromise what God's word says. We compromise our devotion to Jesus. We make it say what we want. Rather, and rather, instead of conforming our behaviors into alignment with the word of God, we spend night and day trying to rework the word of God to reaffirm our lifestyle and attitude. That's compromise. Fifth thing, he calls out trying to impress the world. Two churches have this reputation of trying to impress the world, Sardis and Laodicea. Both of those churches, he calls them out for trying to impress. You're rich and all this. No, you're soldier diaper. You think you're awesome and and you're proud and you boast, but the truth is you're lukewarm. This is a huge message for us, folks. It's a huge message for you individually and me individually. It's also a huge message for the church. The people of God, when we care more about what the world says about the church than we do about what Jesus says about the church. Like, we care about the size of our church and the size of our budget and the numbers and the, the, all these things that, you know, how, how do we look to the world? Does our facility look good to the world? Does, do our numbers look good to the world? Do the, does the people who come by, are other churches impressed with us? Is the world impressed with us? Do they think we're awesome? And all the while we're not asking the question, what does Jesus think of me? Number six, he condemns mediocrity as a spiritual sickness. Ephesus, Laodicea, they both are condemned because of their mediocrity. Ephesus has lost their first love. Laodicea is lukewarm. It's mediocrity. And and what is mediocrity? Mediocrity is nominal Christianity, as we talked about. It's also a sense of, I don't really need you, God. I don't really need you. I got it. I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm self-satisfied. And it's, 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 um, it's led by questions like, how much can I get away with? <laughs> Rather than, how can I glorify Christ? How much can I get away with and still be called a Christian? It's the wrong question, right? Do you, do you approach marriage that way? Oh, snap. <laughs> if you approached marriage that way, get a divorce attorney. Like, if we approach marriage like, I'm married, but how much can I get away with and still be married? Still, not much. That's the wrong question. And so as a Christian, like, my question isn't, Jesus, how much can I do and you still cool with me? Rather than, Jesus, how can I live my life and order my life in a way that brings glory and honor to you? That, that validates my love for you, that, that is an example to others of my true devotion to you. Number seven, you guys, people are like, man, I'm glad, I'll be glad when this sermon's over. I can't do any more. I'm... <laughs> Number seven, he promises for every single church, he promises there's hope. There's future glory to those who overcome. Seven times, Jesus says, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. What's he talking about? Conquering. It's the same word that's used at the end of the book of Revelation. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. I, uh, Revelation 21 7. The ability to stand, to endure. 
See, we, we, one of the problems that we have sometimes is we always want something new and different. We want to change. We want to switch it up. And Jesus says, you know, there's a big value in being able to stand and endure, to stick with it. And when we find that our hearts have become cold, when we find that we're lukewarm, when we find that we're nominal or medi- mediocre, when we find that we've lost our first love, when we find that we, we're busy doing things but we've lost our love for Jesus, when we realize that we're tolerating anything despite the fact of what the Word of God says, we make up our own rules. When we find we're there, it, it's not the end of the road. There's hope. We don't have to end up with a a snuffed out lampstand, there's hope. You see, warnings, this is what we don't always understand. Warnings are grace. If I were to tell you when you left here, if you were going south, I would say, look, be careful when you leave because the Bayside Bridge is out. And I, I've seen you at Drew Street. You, you, you go real fast from Drew Street south. I know, I know see you who you are. Well, the bridge is out. And you're like, oh man, it's gonna take me twice as long to get home now. But the warning that the bridge was out is grace. You don't have to go off the bridge. You can adjust. So I want to ask you guys, you can't, like, there's no way to land this sermon on a way with, in in any other way than, is it time to repent? Like, there's no way, there's, I, I've, I've, I've racked my head trying to be, like, how do you land this ship? How do you land this plane? No, this is like a sermon that's pretty intense, so how do we end it? It can't be just keep doing what you're doing without even thinking about it. It's got to be, has my heart grown cold? Have I lost my first love? Would anyone around me even know I'm a Christian if they were to just look at my life. Have I grown tired going through the motions but no real zeal, no real passion? If yes or probably is the answer to any of those questions, Jesus tells us what we do. We remember who he is, and we repent. We go back to our first love. We go back. I'm going to invite you to stand and pray with me. I'm just going to talk to the Lord on behalf of all of us with all of these things, these different things. And if, if one of these is you, just... Join me in prayer and asking God to renew us, restore us, and bring us back to his heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for warnings. These warnings you gave and commendations you gave to the early church, they're they're not only for them, they're for us. And we see ourselves in there. God, some of us, if we're honest, we've lost our first love. We've been in the pursuit of money, of resources, of a better position, of higher pay, of the American dream. That's become our love. And people think we're rich. People think we've got it together. People think we are all that, but we know, Lord, we're poor, blind, and naked. So God, for those of us who are in that place, we... We ask for you to forgive us. Forgive us for pretending. Forgive us for our pride and our arrogance. We come running back to you. Lord, maybe some of us, we look at our lives and we're busy doing good things. We're doing doing things for you in the world, in the church, serving others. But we've lost our love for you, God. We love helping people. We love knowing we made a difference. But we've uh, we've lost our love for you. God, would you restore our hearts? We 
We, uh, as your word instructs us, we repent, we turn away. We turn back to your heart. We ask for your forgiveness. We are sorry we've lost sight of the main thing, which is you. God, thank you for the promise that when we repent, that we will overcome and that a crown of life awaits us. God, I pray for each and every one of my friends and whatever specific needs they have, whether they're in this room or online. God, we want to be a people that loves you completely. Lord, for those who need encouragement, may they see you high and lifted up, offering them encouragement, strength, power, and endurance. Lord, we love you and thank you for your holy word. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you today. Thank you so much for being part of worship. Thank you guys online for joining us in worship. Hope you have a blessed day. Go Bucks.